Uh, wonderful as always. Thank you, Jack. Uh, complex spine checklist, how to use them in my practice. John Smith. Uh, thank you. Th these are my disclosures, and the one thing I <clears throat> want to point out is that I have no financial relationships with Three Greens, and I'm going to be talking about Three Greens, just so you know. So checklists. Checklists really started with the aviation industry, and particularly in 1935, where uh, Boeing was competing to build the ultimate airplane, the Flying Fortress, or the Model 299 also known as a B-17. This was a magnificent airplane, four engines, powerful, could go faster, higher, longer than anything else. And then the first flight that happened with a very experienced pilot took off down the runway with lots of people watching, went to about 300 feet, and then augered in, a lot of people died. And uh, when they uh, looked at why this accident happened, um, it turned out it was completely pilot error. And the pilot error was that he failed to uh, release a locking me mechanism on the elevator for the airplane and the rudder control. So once he got up in the air, he couldn't s steer it, and it crashed. And then the conclusion was this was just too much airplane for one man to fly. And this is the model T-99 or the B-17, incredible plane. Well, so the pilots decided, well, you know, what are we going to do about this? And their solution was they made a very simple checklist, which was not in the aviation industry at the time, where it was simple, it was brief, it was to the point. You touch this, you unlock that, you turn this knob, and, uh, and they made this checklist address each phase of flight. And in the end, uh, this airplane became very flyable and flew millions of miles accident-free once they had implemented this checklist system. So we work in a very complex environment and we deal with kids that are, are, are complicated and have lots of issues and other things. So you know, the problem that we face is the fallibility of human memory and attention. You know, to stay focused on all the kids that we see uh, and, and to remember every detail it, it, in uh, otherwise busy life is hard. And you can lull yourself sort of uh, into skipping steps, you know, just uh, even, you know, when we know these steps are there, we remember sometimes we skip them and they can be very important. And you know, having the attitude of this has never been a problem before until it is, like you're landing and you forget to put your landing gear down. Yeah, it's never uh, bad until it is. So. Surgical checklists in 2019, we all use them. In your OR, you have things on your walls now and, and uh, things that you put up that, that uh, ask you to do things like timeouts and whatever. And um, what we find in the system is that some surgeons really follow these, some use them more than others. And, uh, but the reality is if you skip certain steps, there can be significant uh, um, consequences in terms of safety. So the next question is, can we take checklists to the next level and improve safety in spine surgery? Well, if you've ever asked a pilot, if you're operating on his daughter for scoliosis, and you tell him that you don't use checklists in the OR, he'd think you're nuts, because all pilots use checklists, and, uh, uh, and for very good reasons, like we talked about before. So why use checklists in spine surgery? Well, the first thing is that when you go through a checklist in your OR, uh, whether it's a timeout or whether it's uh, uh, before you make an incision, what you're really doing is you're promoting a culture of safety in the OR where everyone has the opportunity to speak up if they feel that you've neglected something or skipped a step. And it really you know, enables all team members to be part of your team. They're not excluded. And um, people are encouraged to speak up. And it really reduces the complexity because if you just do it routinely and step by step, it's all there. I think it results in fewer mistakes. As people say, operations are, re are routine and patients are not. So my checklist in the operating room started pretty rudimentary with just something taped to the wall that kind of went through steps about positioning and prepping and so forth. And uh, now it's a little more involved. 
Um, but now I use an electronic checklist, and this is what uh, Lloyd Hay and Three Greens came up with. And I, I have a checklist on an iPad that I then plugged into this TV screen that I bought and put on an IV stand. And the part of it is that every step in this checklist, you, everyone in the room can see, and, and you, it evolves as you go through the case. It starts in the pre-op area, goes through uh, um, the timeout, intra-op, and then the post-op plan. And uh, um, this visible uh, confirmation, I think, is important in the OR. The other thing it does is it gives you a time-stamped record of compliance that you haven't skipped any steps. And I think being able to have this in your medical record, uh, there may be certain value in that, that people, if you make a mistake, uh, know that you haven't skipped an important step. And it can be included in the operative record if your uh, hospital is willing. So to take that to the next step, what I've been working with Nick Fletcher and John Heflin and I developed a checklist for early onset scoliosis that actually starts at the time of your first clinic visit where you're planning surgery. These patients are medically complex, and they have lots of comorbidities, and there's lots of things you need to think about in a systematic way before you do surgery. And there's many devices to deal with, um, and you know they all need advanced imaging. You have to make sure that when you schedule someone for surgery you know, three months in advance that you actually ordered an MRI, but that you actually looked at it. Things like that that can, in a busy, uh, hectic life can be overlooked or you don't want to put someone to sleep and go, oh, I just looked at the MRI and he has a Chiari and you know, we have to wake him up again. So this is all about safety and planning. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> so this is just an example of this early onset checklist that starts um, with step by step, what, what, what's their disease, what are you going to do, and then starts looking at um, uh, you know, other issues. And then when you get to things like, do they have a baclofen pump? Do they have a vagal nerve stimulator? Does it need to be turned on and off? What's the size of tubing if you have to cut their baclofen pump tubing? Because there's two sizes. These are all things that, as you systematically go through these patients with a checklist, uh, with them in your office and on your iPad, I think makes you think through these things step by step. And like, yes, that's a problem. No, it isn't. Um, and then you can go through each system, whether it's GI, heart, uh, uh, respiratory, whatever it is, and you can go through these step by step and make sure you're thinking of all these things. The older you get, the more you need things like this. <laughs> it's a memory aid. Um, so when I started using this and I presented it to our hospital system, and I showed it to the people who make decisions about are they gonna spend any money, and we have this new medical record that's very hard to use. They're like, their pushback was incredible. It's like, well, the website's kind of terse, it's proprietary software, it's standalone, it's hard to replicate other software into our system, it's really never easy. Um, if Dr. Smith is finding this useful, why integrate it into our EHR? Well, I think we have a good reason why. And, you know, if you wish to pursue this, here's a million committees and administrative steps that you have to go through and follow, et cetera, et cetera. So, <laughs> You know, nothing is easy, right, even when it's about safety. So, uh, you know, moving forward, I always say no is the first step in any negotiation. So uh, we're working through that. So checklists don't really prevent all errors. Uh, this was one of mine. Um, and I even use checklists at home. My, my daughter, who was in first grade, had heel pain, I told her she had Seaver's disease and that she needed to take ibuprofen and, and wear new shoes. And she had a little checklist each day, still hurts, still hurts. And uh, you, know, you hate to get to school without your lunch box or comb your hair or brush your teeth. So checklists can really uh, change your life in many different ways. And uh, I think they do, uh, once you're used to using them, improve safety. Uh, and checklists engage your team. And this, Jack just talked about spine teams. This is mine, and they're incredible, and we have social hours as well. Thank you.